Awesome. Thanks for the warm introduction. And we're going to try our best to match that enthusiasm this morning. I don't know if we'll stay with it the whole time, but my name is Bob Baker. I'm from Peak Corporate Council. And uh, my partner, Matt Shrimpton, and I are really excited to be here to speak at Startup Boston Week and, uh, and hopefully share with you some insights into what we do and uh, maybe think about how to, if you're a founder or a co-founder or you know a co-founder, um, how to basically uh, future-proof your company and uh, look out for some stuff that we've seen in our practice. So I uh, just wanted to make a couple of acknowledgements uh, right off the bat so that I don't forget about them at the end of the session. Uh, big thanks to Stephanie Rulick for uh, basically just putting this this massive, spectacular event on. Uh, really great job for her. And uh, Lauren Rich, uh, for lack of a better word, our handler, thank you for answering all of our emails um, again and again, especially when we didn't get your answer the first time. And um, uh, big thanks to uh, Gene Baker managing our books and our finances uh, at the firm. And uh, also, if you were at the networking event last night, you probably saw a lot of our swag, a lot of our branding. Uh, we have very, very slick marketing. And uh, we have a very sophisticated marketing team. And I'm going to embarrass her and ask her to stand up, Christina Baker, also my wife. Uh, she's not standing up. She's refusing. All right. That's OK. And, uh, and last but certainly not least, my partner, Matt Shrimpton, who as of September 1 is a brand new dad and uh, is here sleep deprived, but still doing it, still uh, still just, you know, hanging in there. And so hopefully I don't look too much like a zombie up here. Oh, you're good. You're good. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about. Yeah. Uh, today we're going to talk about a little bit about our firm and what we do. Uh, we started in 2020 and um, right in the middle of the pandemic and uh, a, lot, a lot of the the things about the pandemic and the lockdown sort of influenced the way we we do business and the way we interact with founders and um, a big part of that is making sure that we're focused on cost reducing cost because that's a, a primary concern for founders um, and also making sure that we can deliver legal services efficiently and really just be at that ground level because that's what people need um, so the topic for today came to us kind of easily because it's something that we've dealt with um, time and time again. And uh, as, as Matt and I talked about it, we realized that we've uh, developed this expertise of managing co-founders and the way they structure things and also some of the problems that might arise a little bit later after they've structured their initial documents. Uh, and and I, I said like, hey, we've actually, we've kind of got this record of uh, successfully, knock on some wood, dealing with these issues that come up. And uh, so we're gonna walk you through that today. Uh, the first things first, we're gonna talk about the founding team, some of the discussions that we have with them, um, whether or not they own assets, whether the company owns assets, uh, cap table management, and then in terms of how those shares are purchased so that they actually become stockholders in the company. We'll talk about that. Um, also, we'll work in some, some investor viewpoints because a lot of our clients are venture capital backed and that can, um, you know, that can influence the decision making process. Uh, and then we'll wrap it all up with a story and try to incorporate a lot of what we talked about into a, into a somewhat real life scenario. Uh, so just a little bit about me. I started my legal career doing telecom work and land use siting, and uh, that was intensely uninteresting. And so I took a hard ride out of that and I decided I really want to do startup law. So that's what I started uh, doing. I started coming to events like this uh, back in 2017 when it started. And it's just it's just intensely interesting work. So I'm excited to be here. Uh, really, what I do at the firm is um, is uh, really kind of like the holistic uh, management of companies and their founders uh, from uh, formation all the way through to an exit and everything that goes along along the way. Uh, venture capital financings, um, employee issues, you know, uh, different kinds of raises, things like that. So I'll turn it over to Matt for a short introduction about himself, and then we'll get started. Hi, I'm Matt Shrimpton. Um, so like Bob, so I got started uh, actually working uh, actually way back in the day in law school. I was I was interning at uh, a bunch of startups, uh, found I really enjoyed uh, the, the sort of entrepreneurial spirit, uh, you know, the creativity that was involved there, the, the unique challenges to try to deal with. I continued doing that uh, post law school, uh, ended up in the finance world where I spent a lot of time working uh, with information technology, licensing and contracts and negotiating those types of agreements. So I have, uh, you know, quite a lot of experience uh, working uh, that aspect, you know, both large and small deals. Uh, so I tend to focus on, uh, you know, my part of the practice on a lot of that uh, stuff, for lack of a better term. Uh, so IT licensing, uh, you know, how, how to 
you know, help a startup uh, protect their, their assets. Uh, you know, I'll work with uh, our clients on data privacy issues because that's always, uh, you know, in the forefront or should be in people's minds as they're collecting information on, on their users or their customers or, or whomever. Uh, and, you know, then I also, uh, you know, work on uh, intellectual property protection, trademarks and copyrights and, and, and those sorts of things. Uh, like we kind of mentioned, uh, so our services are, are really geared towards, uh, you know, startups. Uh, you know, so we, we try to offer, uh, you know, just about every, um, you know, counsel on every aspect of, of a startup that they might need. Uh, you know, we work uh, on the venture financing side, you know, the pre-seed, uh, you know, Series A and beyond, you know, IP issues, like I just mentioned, uh, you know, m and um, as well as some uh, fund formation in, in general securities law. All right, so let's dive into it. So. I kind of want to start at the very beginning because because that's where um, you know the issues potentially start arising. Right? So if you imagine you're you're a founder, uh, you have yet to form uh, your company, or maybe you're working with uh, you know a couple couple friends or a couple uh, you know a couple potential co-founders. Um, you know you're you're looking for for, for where to start, uh, and uh, you, you know you're trying to assemble your team, and, and you have all these questions. You're just sort of really focused on developing. Uh, developing your product, getting things off the ground, and, and sometimes the legal questions kind of sort of fall to the side. So, so what we try to say is, is as you're putting your team together, you know, if, you're, if you're dealing with people or if you're dealing with companies outside of yourselves, um, if you're going to own anything, which you almost always will, that's it's a lot of the uh, purpose of, of starting a firm is to own assets that you can then monetize um, or, uh, you know, if you're accepting financing, those are sort of the three triggers that we always recommend people sort of engage attorneys on. Um, you know, it's tough if you're starting out, oftentimes you have no funds or limited funds. Um, so sometimes you need to choose sort of between bread and legal services. I, we understand that. Uh, but, but that's always kind of the sort of the guiding, guiding light that we sort of recommend people do, because as, as you'll sort of see throughout this kind of conversation, uh, if you ignore those things or rush through them or put them off to the side, you know, issues can crop up. Um, you know, like I said, if, if, if your company is going to own assets, uh, you, you need to make sure that uh, all the intellectual property is assigned from the founders to the company, right? So the company is what is going to own um, all the property. It's not gonna be owned individually by the founders. Sometimes that's an issue because people are very passionate about what they develop. They don't, they don't see they don't make the connection between the ownership of the company and the product that they've worked on that, that can sometimes be a bit of a sticking point but it's very important to make sure that the company is going to own all of what's being developed whether that's trade secrets or software or or, or anything along those lines even even patents um i also want to kind of highlight uh if you're working with dev teams so if, if there's you know people on a founding um on a founding team that, that you know aren't so you know proficient in developing and they're looking to farm out, um, you know, the design development and build of, of say an app, for instance, uh, you, you want to be very wary of who you're contracting with and what that contract looks like. Uh, not necessarily from a, as an assignment perspective, because that's usually kind of taken care of, but, but there are, um, there are companies out there that will uh, leverage or take advantage of the desire to jump into something and the excitement that, that a founding team would have and, and, sort of get over some, some not very favorable contracting terms that can kind of crop up and, and sort of be an issue uh, in the future. Um, and then there's also, uh, you know, one of the other things we like to talk about is, is the cap table or sort of the equity kind of allocation. Uh, that, that's gonna be a very large discussion. And we, we, we get questions all the time, like what, what should we allocate? You know, who should we allocate it to? You know, we have four founding members. You know, do we do a split? Do we, you know, the equal split? Do we do something else? Um, you know, that, that's very important because it's, it's who has control of the company, you know, if, if someone has a super majority share, when, when things come to vote, you know, they're, they're going to go that way. You know, or, or if you have to do more of a consensus build on things that, um, you know, things that are ultimately going to be voted on by the company, it's going to take a bit more work, um, you know, to, to reach that decision than if someone's able to kind of, uh, we'll say, sort of ram kind of decisions through as, as they sort of see fit. And then, um you know, as you accept investment, there are uh, different terms that, that investors will, will uh, ask for and require that will impact, um, you know, at exit, ultimately, um, you know, what money goes to whom uh, at the end of the day. So those, those are 
uh, sort of three kind of concepts that we really kind of keep in mind that we urge founders to consider as they're sort of starting on this journey, um, you know, to, uh, of entrepreneurship. All right, so, so like I sort of alluded to, um, you know, cap table management or sort of the equity spread is very important. Um, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, like I said, if there's four founders, it doesn't need to be 25, 25, 25. Uh, you know, it could be allocated, uh, you know, more on sort of expected effort maybe. You know, maybe two founders are, are sort of just roommates of, of the guy who has the idea and, you know, they're kind of just talking over late night sessions and things like that. that you know, they might not necessarily deserve or, or should receive an equal percentage of somebody who's going to, uh, you know, really take the lead on, on building, uh, you know, the product or, uh, you know, trying to develop the company because just maybe they're just, you know, they're just sort of there and they're, they're helping facilitate things, um, you know, but, but that can be an awkward conversation, right? Because, you, you know, you, you have your, your roommates and, and they all think we're going to share equally and, and, and it becomes, becomes a tough sort of challenge. Um, the other kind of aspect to consider is, is, you know, is someone bringing cash to the table and what, and what, um, you know, what percentage of, of ownership would that look like, uh, you know, for, for, for the, you know, for the cash that they bring to the table. Um, I will say it's, it's, it's really important to kind of address these issues early. Like the, you'll see that as a constant theme throughout this, uh, this presentation. Um, you know, sometimes people don't even buy their shares until you're a year or two down the road uh, and things have happened. And then maybe people don't feel like what you've discussed from an ownership perspective at the beginning and what everyone thought was, uh, you know, their understood sort of path forward that doesn't reflect what's sort of developed. So, uh, you know, there's, there's risk to not kind of nailing all these things down uh, at the very beginning. All right. Um, so other things to consider when you're, when you're kind of assembling your, your team, you're, you know, you're sort of your Avengers who are going to be with you on this, on this trip. Uh, you know, like I said, so expertise, maybe there's someone who is, uh, you know, uh, really strong in, in development. You, you know, he's, he or she is going to spend, uh, you know, the, the bulk of their time uh, developing the app. No one else is really going to do that. Maybe another founder has more sales experience. Um, you know, those are, those are sort of two different dynamics that are going to come into play uh, as, as people sort of discuss, uh, you, you know, what, what their team is going to look like, what their allocation is going to look like. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe someone's a visionary. Maybe, maybe it's their idea, but they don't know how to put it into practice, you know, and then you need people who can uh, sort of be up in the clouds, but you also need, you know, you need boots on the ground. And, and, and what does that look like? Uh, you know, Similar, uh, you know, to the vision, your your, your ideas, um, and, but maybe uh, you know someone has investor connections. You know, maybe maybe they're joining uh, the firm or, or the uh, the company almost solely because of who they know. Because as, as you know, you all probably know, um, you know, the runway can be short in in startup companies. So if 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 there's access to capital, um, that that could be very uh, very important for a, for a new company. So one of the discussions that we have with people is, when do I buy my shares? And like Matt said, um, sometimes we'll have people use tools like slicing pie, where they'll try to really drill down into ownership and and what each founder thinks they're uh, you know the deserving. And uh, ultimately, what we need them to do is we need them to, to purchase the shares of stock. Because unless you do, you're not an actual stockholder of the company. So there's no ownership until you until you own it. Um, and uh, usually how that's done is through a restricted stock purchase agreement. Uh, so the, uh, the restricted part of that versus just a standard stock purchase agreement is that the company would be able to repurchase those shares. So that's a really critical piece of that. Um, it's also subject to a vesting schedule. The shares are subject to vesting. So uh, the, the way that dynamic works is you'll be purchasing your shares. Uh, let's say that you're a, uh, there are 10 million shares authorized uh, for sale by the company and you're a 25% owner. So let's say you're purchasing two and a half million shares. Um, if you're going to purchase those two and a half million shares, you don't necessarily get to keep them all, uh, even though you're a record owner of them right away. The way that uh, the company can incentivize that founder to stick around and make sure that they're not just leaving with a huge stake in the company is to subject those shares to repurchase. And then the vesting schedule will look something like, okay, after a certain number of months, 
uh, perhaps even years, then those shares will no longer be subject to repurchase. And so you'll actually own those no matter what. Um, and I'll put a little asterisk there after the no matter what, because we'll get to that later. Um, and in terms of um, in terms of the vesting schedule, that can take a lot of different forms. The standard that we'll see is uh, you'll usually hear, uh, you know, if you're a part of a, a company or you're uh, negotiating to become part of a, a startup company is a four years with a one year cliff. And so what that will mean is that typically you'll have 25% um, of your shares or so vest after one year of service. So you're with the company for a year, you'll get 25% of those shares no longer subject to repurchase. And then uh, usually monthly after that, sometime somewhere in the ballpark of like two and, and change percent every single month. Um, and so month by month, you'll see those shares um, leave the repurchase pool and they'll go into your into your pocket, so to speak. And uh, and that makes you feel good, you know, as a, you're sort of putting in the time and making sure that, uh, you know, you're putting a lot of effort in and the company's getting what they want because they're not necessarily giving you that value, even though the shares may not have a lot of value apart from like a notional value, um, at least initially. Okay, so we talked about the vesting schedule. Um, I want to just mention, and, and we're setting a stage, this will all make sense, I promise, in a, in a few minutes. We're going to set the stage for uh, why the vesting schedule is so important and also the risks of it. Um, I mentioned that the, the most common vesting schedule is a four-year with a one-year cliff. So it's 25% after a year and then monthly thereafter. Um, that's infinitely flexible. So you could have something that is much shorter. Uh, you could have something that's much longer. You could have uh, shares start vesting after two years. The, the, the issues with that are, you know, obviously from the person purchasing the shares, you don't want to wait two years, right? I mean, anything could happen. Um, it's sort of like this carrot that's being dangled, but just out of reach. And it's just a really long time to wait um, until you feel like a true owner of those shares in the company. The, the problems with it is that the vesting commencement date is very often manipulated and uh, manipulated in the sense that the, the founders, if they're not paying attention to it or if they're not having somebody ask those tough questions about when they actually started work at the company uh, or you know what the likelihood is of everyone staying together, then uh, you'll find yourself in a situation where uh, somebody will backdate their vesting commencement date, which means that their shares, a lot of the shares have already vested by the time you know they get these agreements in place. And so you could have a concept where, uh, say, let's go back to our 25% owner as an example. Um, if he or she leaves after, uh, after a certain amount of time, or let's say an example here, a 33% owner, um, if they leave uh, after a certain amount of time, then a certain percentage of that of those shares could go with them, whether or not they're, they're dedicating more time and effort to the company. And so, uh, um, that leaves some problems that we're going to discuss here in just a second. Uh, part of the um, part of the problem, or I should say, the main problem that it creates if somebody leaves with a lot of shares in their pocket, is the fact that ultimately you only have a hundred percentage points to work with. And uh, sometimes we we get that question, and it feels a little awkward for us to explain that. Well you can't issue more shares because then everyone is diluted down. Everyone's shares are worth a little bit less. Um, there, there are only a hundred percentage points. So it's not like, you know, we're, we're not back in fifth grade. We can't do 110% on that, that extra credit assignment. So it puts us in that difficult position of saying, well, you could, um, you know, you could have someone leave, but if they're taking a chunk of the company with them, uh, say a sizable chunk, whether it's, you know, double digits or otherwise, um, then that really, it, it puts a mark on a company, it puts a dark um, spot on the company's record. And it really sends a, flat, a red flag to um, stakeholders like investors, particularly, who say that, well, you know, I'm, not, I'm not really that interested in giving the company money because you know, my return as an investor is gonna be substantially less because we have someone here who is no longer contributing anything. They're not contributing capital. They're not contributing effort, not contributing expertise. Um, they've just left. And what do we do with that? And so uh, that creates a, a, a really bad problem for the company, because at that point, you're talking about an existential risk to the company's health and, and survivability. And, um, you know, we've had uh, founders who have had this problem before and, and come to us. And uh, some of their initial responses are, 
uh, well, do we leave it alone or, or you know, do we shut the company down? And that's you, kind of a drastic response. It's usually not where we want to go with it. Uh, but what we're trying to say is basically that this is a problem that, that needs to be corrected. And so there are some ways to do that. Okay, so I think we've set the stage pretty good. Uh, we come up to our uh, somewhat real life scenario, although we're changing the names a little bit, as you can see on the screen here. So uh, we've got three um, co-founders and uh, click the next slide. Got three co-founders, uh, Mario, Luigi, and Bowser. And they're part of a company called Rainbow Road Inc. Right? And Rainbow Road Inc. Uh, does a lot of different things. Uh, they, uh, you know, they've got some app development going on. Uh, they make uh, some shock absorbers for e-bikes. A um, couple of other things, you know, just, just really diversified uh, product base. So um, they've done quite a lot early on uh, when they were in their uh, cohort at MIT. Uh, they've since graduated. And uh, they, they knew that they had to incorporate in Delaware because they, they saw that on TikTok somewhere. So they decided, okay, we're gonna incorporate in Delaware. Um, and then they used ChatGPT to get their, their organizing documents, uh, basically put all that together. And, um, and then Stavart, uh, started developing a lot of products across numerous lines. Um, and they even landed a couple of post money safes. Um, so they had investors come in and say, hey, we're not ready to do a priced round yet, but we wanna give you some money. Uh, we like what you're doing, so we're gonna give you some safes. Um, 18 months after signing the founder agreements, uh, Mario decides to take an opportunity at Amazon uh, Web Services, making obviously a lot more money than he's going to at the startup. Um, and so he decides to <clears throat> he decides to tell the other two co-founders, "Hey, uh, this has been great, but you know I'm going to leave." Um, so 40% of Mario shares have vested. Uh, the, the gap on the cap table is about 13%, all right? So 13% of those shares are now with Mario, he's gone. And that puts us in a bit of a dilemma because investors have said, guys, this, this company, you, now you've got 13% of the company missing. Uh, Mario, who was your you know, chief technology officer is now gone, tell us how to fix this. All right, so Matt's going to walk us through the dilemma, and um, and we'll see what our options are. Uh, all right, so yeah, so I think uh, you know, the dilemma is kind of sort of becoming a bit clear, I think, in in, in people's minds, right? So uh, the leaving founder, uh, you know, he feels like he's done. Uh, you know, he's sort of got good value for service. He's 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 left, um, but he feels like he's put in, uh, you know, his his time, and and, and he has earned those shares, right? So he has the right to kind of walk away with the company, you know, which he does according to, you know, the documents that they've all, all agreed to and, and, and all that type of stuff. Um, but the company, which is, you know, th that they all form to, to build this product and build these, you know, these, uh, these other products to diversify, uh, it, you know, their portfolio and, and become successful, right? The, the, the reason they all got together, uh, you know, they need, they need people to continue providing value for uh, the equity that they're earning, right? And, and this is a big chunk of, of equity that is now theoretically off the table, right? So, so there's this, this, this gap or this, this sort of black spot that Bob mentioned on the cap table. And, and they're really, uh, you know, they're really struggling to sort of come to grips with that. And they've, they've met some investors who are really hesitant to, to, to invest in, in their company specifically for this reason. It's not, you know, they, they came out and said specifically, you know, this is this is the issue we're concerned about uh, this whole. Right. Um, but as as a relatively new company, um, you know, how do you how do you quantify that? You know, you'll see in a second. Um, one of the ways to kind of address this is try to, to, to repurchase shares that could be expensive. Right. So you know, where's money? Money might be a little tight. Uh, you know, how do they resolve this here? Um, you know, investors, uh, you know, have expressed frustration, like I just mentioned, uh, you know, that there is a hole. So, you know, you, you have a real push and pull between someone who's felt like they put in a lot of effort. Uh, you know, maybe they've soured on, on the, the entrepreneurial life. They, they want to move to AWS and, uh, you know, the equity is, is not what they thought it was going to be. And they want to make, you know, tangible cash at, at this moment. And then you got the company and, and the remaining founders who want to continue this vision. They want to continue to build what they all started. Uh, and then, you know, on the third side, you have investors who say it's tough to give you that runway if if you don't resolve this open concept. All right. So so 
approaches that, that we've sort of seen and we, we've we've taken with with our clients have kind of fallen into sort in three buckets. Now, one is is allow Mario to leave with the shares. You just just walk away. You 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 you've had the vested shares. Uh, you know you own them. We'll we'll take the hit on the cap table, uh, and we'll just try to deal with that. Or or maybe the company won't continue to exist. It's a bit extreme, but but that might be you know the case. It's 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 in the back of the minds of, of the existing the remaining founders. Um, the unvested shares obviously come back to the to the company because they've signed RSPAs. So the unvested shares will, will effectively automatically be returned, uh, and they will not be no longer owned by um, this departing founder. Uh, you know, second second approach that we've seen uh, try to negotiate with the departing founder for a purchase. Uh, you know, again, there, there's potential pitfalls with that, uh, you know, cost being the primary one of them. Uh, and then the third is to, uh, you know, there's a couple different sort of legal theories out there um, that can kind of mitigate the impact of, uh, of, of the departing founders departure uh, for the company to allow them hopefully to continue on um, with maybe this, this uh, debt equity on, on the books, uh, but then of course allow the founder to leave with, with the equity. Um, so just take a quick poll for, for those who are in the room. Um, if you could just raise your hands, who likes, who likes option one? Uh, you got one. Perfect. <laughs> always one. I like it. Who likes option two? Uh, a few more, a few more. Uh, and then option three. All right. So, okay. So about equal, even on option two and option three. Uh, there's our poll slide. <laughs> uh, all right, so so I'll walk through the walk through the options. Uh, you know, option one is is the, the lowest legal risk. Uh, like I said, uh, you know, you, you all just shake hands and part ways, right? You have you have what's what's yours, we have what's ours, um, you know, and, and that's sort of that. Um, the risk is the risk is is obvious. So like we like we sort of touched on quite a few times, uh, the company might not uh, be appealing to investors. Uh, so you'll either have to Seek investment elsewhere, um, which is very challenging. It can be, especially in uh, you know in this environment. Or uh, you're going to have to find alternatives uh, to keep the company going. Um, and then the other sort of maybe unspoken aspect is uh, kind of the people aspect. So if you see, you know, if you're an existing founder, you're 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 putting your blood, sweat, and tears into this company. You know, you you got long nights, long days. Uh, you know, maybe you're you're not eating as well as you you should or you could uh, because you're so devoted to uh, making this thing work. What, what does it look like to you? Um, what are you thinking if uh, somebody just walks away, takes a job at, at, at AWS for, for a lot of money and is still keeping uh, their chunk, his or her chunk, uh, and reaping the benefits of, of your hard work without putting anything in um, themselves? So Alex, See a few hands in the air for the um, use legal tactics. That sounds kind of sinister, I know, but that's kind of where we come in. So uh, that's why we're all here, right? To learn about the, the legal uh, methods that might be available to you as a co-founder or a, or a um, you know a CEO of a company to make sure that it survives. And that's really like what we focus on. I mean, that is that is our goal when we talk to founders, uh, the executives. We're thinking, okay, like how does this company survive? You know, because there's so many things, so many externalities that are working against companies to, to prevent them from, from surviving. And you've got market conditions, you've got, you know, uh, runway, which sort of factors in here. Uh, you've got just like all kinds of stuff working against the, the founders and, um, and their companies. And so we look at this as sort of an opportunity to make sure that we're using everything at our disposal to make sure that the company can survive. So, um, one of those tools is called the reverse stock split. And uh, this is, uh, if there's any lawyers in the audience, uh, maybe judging our, our methods here, um, I'm sure they'll have some opinions on that. But the reverse stock split is a concept where you, you're basically going to uh, manipulate the cap table in a perfectly legal way, of course, um, by amending the company's charter. And so what that will do is it will reduce the number of shares that are issued outstanding. Um, that reduces everyone across the board. And then uh, subsequent to that, you'd be doing a new issuance, uh, which is also considered a dilutive round. And so the, the rest of the folks who are there at the company would have their shares increased. And then the person who left would, would basically be left at the, um, at the lower number of shares. So it is, um, 
it is supportable under certain jurisdictions. Uh, so under Delaware law, you can you can use this tactic. Um, it has some it has some strong opinions on either side. Obviously, depending on who we're talking to, we've had uh, we've had exactly these discussions with opposing counsel, and they've said, "Well, no, you're wrong," and we've said, "Well, no, we're right." You know, and it obviously it goes back and forth like that. Um, but my position is that it is supported by Delaware law. It is a path where the the reality is that you know if it if the company is going to decide that it is going to to choose this path um, in order to preserve its own survival, then in my mind that legal risk is um, you know is worth the effort. And so um, ultimately, what it comes down to is whether or not the whether or not the the departing founder has been deprived of of something i mean you know you've got a you've got a contract you've got a restricted stock purchase agreement and that's a, a you know it's a binding agreement between two individuals or an individual and a company and that holds up in court but at the same time you know agreements are breached and, and agreements are worked around and you know circumstances change and this is one of those instances where we could say, hey, this is, you know, this is not necessarily something that is like set in stone. There's a way to work around that. What it comes down to is whether or not the departing founder feels like they are properly compensated for those shares. Because ultimately, if um, what they're what they're after is they're after the the liquidation, right? They, I mean, that is why that's why they have the shares in the first place. That's why they care about them. It's because ultimately, if the company is sold has some kind of liquidity event, they're going to receive the benefits of that. So <clears throat> what they're interested in mostly is basically just making sure that they're getting that value. And what that comes down to is fair market value. And if you look through you know, decisions in, in the Delaware courts, um, that is where, where most of it comes down to. There is a little bit of discussion around the process has to be a fair and, and open process. It has to be a process that's not motivated by any kind of animus or, or any kind of uh, you know sketchy tactics or anything like that. We try to avoid um, you know bullying. This really is just a just an opportunity for the company to solve a problem, and it could cost them some money. And so that's that's ultimately what, uh, what it comes down to. Uh, the down round issuance is kind of the second part of that. You could actually. Um, strictly speaking, skip the reverse stock split um, portion of this solution. Uh, but at the same time, you end up, if you, if you do simply a down round dilutive issuance, which is where you issue everyone a number of shares to get them back up where they need to be and reduce that departing founder, you end up with a, a cap table that's very um, off kilter. So you end up with people owning, you know, 50, 70 million shares uh, and, you know, just to sort of outbalance that. Uh, and that looks weird for lack of a better term. Like it's just, you don't want to look weird as, as a company. You want your cap table to look right. You want your corporate documents to look right. Investors don't want to look at it and say, well, why do you have, you know, why are there a billion shares issued and outstanding? So generally what you want is you, you want somewhere around um, five to 10 million shares issued and outstanding prior to a, to a priced round, uh, just to make sure everything looks right. Um, so to talk about the most, probably the most common uh, tactic that we use and ultimately where we're getting with the, the legal tactics, like where we want to end up, uh, Matt's going to talk about option two and uh, the benefits of that. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, option two is, uh, it, it's a nice blend of uh, you know, sort of option one and option three, right? So you have uh, a potential, uh, you know, potential legal uh, process hanging over overhead of, of a departing founder that the company may be able to use, which would incentivize uh, both parties coming to the table, right? And, and, and like Bob said, um, you know, I think cash is, is really what people are looking for, especially if, if someone's leaving, uh, you, you know, they want to see, value for the shares. Uh, they, you know, don't really have an interest in, in the company uh, anymore. Uh, you know, that, that's why they've chosen to leave and, and not um, contribute and, and earn additional equity. Uh, you know, they, they've chosen to, to leave with what they could, uh, what they could receive uh, on, a, on an abbreviated vesting schedule. Uh, so, so we see that this is, uh, see this is a very great alternative um, to, to the other two options because it just gets both parties to the table. Uh, it allows, uh, you know, the sort of market forces to kind of come into play and the ability of 
uh, you know, the negotiators on both sides to uh, find a middle ground, uh, determine, uh, you know, the appetites of, of both parties and kind of cut through a little bit of the noise to, to really reach um, a, a solution that, that will allow the company to, to remain viable, but will also allow, um, you know, the founder to receive what, you know, what they think is, is, is rightfully theirs. So, so it's a really nice middle ground, assuming you can get there. Uh, so, like I said, so the, the ideal outcome here, uh, you know, the company is going to uh, remain strong and remain viable. It's going to continue to uh, to exist. The, the impediment of, uh, of the founder of the dead equity has been either removed or reduced. Uh, so you become uh, reappealing or, or uh, more appealing to uh, the investors, especially if there's a specific investor that has had a, a qualm with, with this, um, you know, this departure. Uh, you've, uh, you've removed somebody who is uh, you know, not going to be a participant. They're not, they're not on the bus. Uh, anymore, to, you know, so you've, you've allowed them to, to leave, um, you know, the documents that, that you would enter into once you reach a negotiated settlement with the founder, uh, with the departing founder, uh, would allow the company to mitigate risk. Uh, so there would be a release of claims, uh, uh, you know, associated with the repurchase uh, of their shares. Um, so, so you would really uh, cut back on that. And then, um, you know, ideally, uh, this uh, the settlement amount that, 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 you know, you reach an agreement on, uh, with this departing founder is is a reasonable one uh, that the company can uh, can handle and allow them to kind of continue to to operate. Um, you know, it's obviously it's it's up to what uh, you know every specific sort of situation where a company finds himself in. You know, the the factors are going to be different every single time. Um, you know, we've seen uh, sort of payments uh, for for startups of, of sort of fifty to seventy k. Uh, seems to be an appropriate amount for someone who's owning a, a very significant, very sizable portion of a company that's it's, it's growing and very successful and, and is really attracting sort of um, eyes and, and interest from uh, from investors. Um, so that's actually what happened. So if you go all the way back to, to Rainbow Road, um, that's what happened with with Mario. Uh, we were able to get uh, Mario to the table with his counsel. Uh, you know, that's another thing that, that I didn't mention. Uh, you know, it's important that the founder, uh, the departing founder, seek and solicit uh, their own counsel. You know, this is not an instance where uh, the counsel for the company is going to, uh, you know, uh, well, he wouldn't represent both sides anyways, but this is not, you know, this is especially not an instance where, um, you know, there's going to be any sort of joint counsel or joint representation or uh, counsel serving both sides. The, the, the departing founder is now, sort of on opposite sides of, of the company and they would need to have their own uh, representation. So you would negotiate um, just like Rainbow Road did with the departing founder, their, their counsel for um, a settlement amount that was uh, you know, satisfactory to both parties. And you, you sign your documents, you, you do your handshake um, and you sort of dust your hands and um, you know, company is now continuing and, and still going strong. And uh, you know, as of last check, they're, they're there are multiple interests from, from multiple investors. So I would say it's a quite a success story at this moment. Thank you. That was very informative. And uh, I have a question about laying the groundwork for that. So if I'm not mistaken, you can actually in the founders agreement already strive for outcome three in the event that one of the founders wants to leave. And in, in, in the agreement, right, that there will be discussions around repurchasing of the stock, if I'm not mistaken. My question is, can you also lay the groundwork for what is a fair assessment process for that, for the fair market value to compensate the partner, partner who leaves? You can. Yeah, great question. And that's, um, I'm glad you brought that up because that kind of leads us into, you know, what are the, what are the things that we can put in place uh, prior to, and I kind of mentioned them earlier, Matt had discussed, um, or, or I had discussed, making sure that um, your resting schedule makes sense, you know, making sure that you're not manipulating that date so that people aren't, aren't walking with those shares and just making sure that, that everyone is, um, you know, they're really, they're really kind of like bound in service to the company um, in a good way for as long as possible. But yeah, you can absolutely determine what fair market value is. And, and that, um, uh, Matt had mentioned that the, the average um, 
buyout, at least for the for the instances that we've handled, is uh, it's around sixty five to seventy thousand um, dollars, just in terms of the ultimate buyout amount. And so that is the point of contention in a hundred percent of the time. It's basically just it's not an issue really of whether the the departing founder is going to go or whether it wants to leave. It's an issue of um, what's going to happen to my shares after I go. You know, on the one hand, they want what's owed to them, and that's perfectly reasonable, right? They should. They should be they should be afforded what's owed to them. But at the same time, if they hang on to those shares and be really obstinate about it, they're almost sinking their opportunity to get the liquidation value out of those shares because what are they going to do with, with a company that's not investable or, or is not going to succeed and so um but yeah you can absolutely uh, negotiate that ahead of time and as long as everyone has had an opportunity to think about what the fair market value is however that's decided i mean you could you could base it on a on a 409a valuation which uh, a lot of Vesta or a lot of funded companies will do to make sure that they can issue stock options with the uh the, the relevant um uh, safe harbor under 409a but you know absent that you, you could also just decide like okay we're going to call it a dollar a share you know so, so if if somebody is walking with a million shares that cost you a million bucks it's probably a little bit high but uh depending on where the company is in their in their stages of financing and success it may not be yep. uh th thank you for sharing uh such an interesting case in your advice uh my name is Tony Zen. I'm organizer of Founders Community. Mm -hmm. uh, in my community, in our community, there are uh, two founders uh, who had sort of a similar situations, but a twist. Basically, they have co-founders who are not pulling their weight. So they need to figure out a way to uh, part ways with them. And it can be very contentious. And mm -hmm. also, there's a value uh, resolution uh, to that as well wonder what uh, would be the uh, right approach for you to uh, sort of help uh, these two founders. Just, just so I understand, there's two of them who are, who are going to be? They're two separate companies. Oh, two separate have, companies. They okay. Two, uh, they're co-founders that are now pulling their weight, but they are sharing the same stake uh -huh. in, the, in the startup company. So the founders really wanted to fire the co-founder. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that sounds similar to, to the scenarios that we've dealt with. Um, and, and dual hatting is so common in the startup community. You've got, um, you know, people who are, are, um, are, uh, you know, they're serving in, in multiple roles across multiple, multiple companies, or they have some kind of equity stake in multiple companies. So I, I, I would say the, um, you know, step number one is just to see whether they can determine fair market value uh, of those, or determine how the repurchase is going to look before the lawyers get involved. But I'll say from personal experience, it almost never goes like that. The most recent one we did, and this is why it's such a topical conversation for us, is we, we actually just closed on the most recent scenario here. So actually everything we mentioned with Rainbow Road Inc. has actually happened. That's Those are all like real facts. Um, not that their real names, obviously, but um, that would be interesting if it was. But the um, yeah, the the uh, all of that has actually happened. We actually just closed on the, the most recent one, uh, like a week and a half ago, and it started. Negotiations started between the co-founders in April of this year. They sent me an email just as a heads up and say, "Hey, we've got a, a co-founder leaving. He's going to be cool." So we're going to buy a share back. I got an email like a month later saying, "Hey, he's not cool. So we need we need to we need to sort this out." And it was it was you know, five months of of like protracted negotiations. Um, I think they got out for it for probably less less than eight k in legal fees, which which I think was okay. Uh, and that was all basically us just going back and forth and drafting agreements. But that, that would be my first recommendation is just like, just try to see if they can, like, what do they want? You know, what do they want to get out of it? Um, most of the time it's just money, you know, but it can be very emotional too. Like a lot of, a lot of them have, have poured a lot of time and effort um, and, 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 you know, big chunks of their lives and expertise into these companies. And so it, it can, it can turn from sort of like a, like a legal financial discussion into more of like an emotional one where they get very passionate. And, and, and that I think is the primary driver of saying like, no, we want this, you know, give us what's owed to us. Um, 
and uh, and again get very contentious. I just I want to answer the the email or excuse me, the, the question in the chat just real quick before, I know we have another question in the corner. Uh, if you're a solo founder, is it a bad idea to issue yourself 100% of the shares with no vesting? Um, no, not a bad idea, but I will say that if you are seeking investment at some point, the investors are gonna say, hey, we're gonna need you to, to sign this new agreement and re-subject those to vesting. So uh, just FYI, that's probably what's gonna happen. Would you say that it was a mistake of attorneys not to put some kind of founder agreement uh, uh, reverse stuck in your example? Also, um, is there any appellate uh, precedence on that type of cases? Good questions. Uh, so, so one, we would never make the mistake, but no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, so. Uh, 10 times out of 10, they're, they're coming to us with agreements from, uh, like I mentioned, from ChatGPT and or from, uh, what was the one we heard last night, Clerky? Um, I know there's a bunch of services out there. There's a bunch of like unauthorized practice of law companies that sort of like dabble in this. And they, they the agreements are mostly okay. They really are mostly okay. You know, and, and what we deal with is we deal with that like 2% that's not okay. And usually that 2% is really expensive. Um, in terms of case law supporting it, there is very, very recent case law, like uh, 18 months old or so in the Delaware Court of Chancery, which supports um, the, the tactics that we talked about. Um, it exists in Delaware. I don't know whether it exists in other jurisdictions, but that's primarily where our companies are organized and that's what their agreements are subject to. So we We've tried to make sure that we are in Delaware. It's another important reason to incorporate there. Good questions. Thank you. Are we out of time? Hi, thank you for this. This is awesome. So my name is Steven. I've gone through this a couple of times with founders. And you touched on a topic early, the slicing pie. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could unpack that a little bit. And the second question is, how do you educate founders to anticipate this? Maybe not just after it's all gone nutty. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, do you want to talk about slicing pie or do you want me to take it? Okay, yeah, sure. So uh, slicing pie is is um, is a tool that, uh, first of all, I don't want to besmirch any any like products out there because people use it and they use it to great effect. So slicing pie is a way for people to um, get really precise with how they allocate equity because that's a question that we get all the time. They're like, okay, well, I have a co-founder. How much equity should I give them? And I'd say that's not our job at all. To, to tell you that, I could tell you historically what we usually see, but it is most of the time, it's it's honestly what they rock, paper, scissors for, what they generally feel like they're entitled to, um, and they just hammer it out. The problem with slicing pie is that you end up with the, prior to purchasing your shares, you end up with this, um, uh, you're constantly like moving the goalpost down the road in terms of like, when you're actually buying those shares. And at a certain point, you need to just accept the, the risk that um, not everyone is going to be allocated the exact amount of equity in the company that, that they feel like they should get. Uh, you know, if, if Matt gives a dollar into Rainbow Road Inc., like, does that increase his stake of equity? Like, well, yes, yeah, so technically it should, but like, there's so many other variables at play that, it's just such a difficult thing. And then there's also, I won't um, bore you to tears with the, the um, tax part of it, but there's a lot of really compelling uh, tax reasons to make sure that you're purchasing your shares as soon as possible. So as soon as you can, make sure that you're purchasing your shares with a restricted stock purchase agreement. If you're organized the right way, um, there's enormous tax benefits if you're a, a scalable company, a technology company. So it's just really important to make sure that you, you at some point, you gotta just sit down and do it. Slicing pie, I think it would be good as a preliminary tool uh, for for figuring out where a good starting point is, but uh, at, at a certain point, you have to just say, okay, you know, 25, 25, 25, 25, or whatever the breakdown is. So, I want to grab the second. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm going to toot our own horn, our, our own horn here. Um, those those questions are are always tough to have, and it, it's, it's going to be awkward. And I think it's really helpful to have a, a, a you know an outside party to either ask those questions to to sort of probe those issues with the founders so that those questions can be raised as opposed to swept under the rug uh, and not discussed. And, and, and that's what you also don't get, you know, if you do, if, you know, if you get your documents from an app or from, from chat GPT or, or whatever, you seem to be slagging chat GPT all the time right now. Um, you know, you have someone who's, who's experienced and, and gone through these things and, and seen what happens when, you know, when things break down, because sometimes they do break down. You know, it, it's just the way of the world. 
you know, people's motivations change, people's reasons for doing things change. Uh, it, 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 it's sometimes inevitable. Uh, so to have someone who is, is not the core group say things that, that might be a little questionable and might be a little sort of agitative uh, that gets people thinking so that they can make their own decisions and go off and have those discussions, I think is, is, is very helpful. Great, guys. We probably have time for one more question, and then we've got about four minutes left. So here we go. Hi, thanks. Um, it was great to hear about kind of the breakup process. Um, I'm at an earlier stage where I know I want a technical co-founder. I haven't identified that person yet, but I feel like I need to kind of uh, start executing on things on my own with the intention of bringing in a co-founder within six months to a year, like what kind of advice would you have in terms of like how you go about setting up the, the terms of that for yourself, knowing that you expect to have a co-founder or is it really just like whatever, figure it out when you get there, just like do whatever you were going to do as a solo founder. Sure. Yeah, I'll chip in. I'm sure we can both add something. Um, so I would say that, um, uh, the great divider in terms of, of equity allocation is time. So if you, um, if you showed up, like if you're there first, your idea, your company, your incorporation, your, you know, shares to start, um, everyone that comes in afterwards, there, there's definitely a, um, there's definitely like a hierarchy in terms of, of how many shares to give them. So like typically what we'll see is if you're hiring, uh, say like a CTO, you know, technical person to come on board, um, if they're not there at the early stages and they're not really bringing a huge amount of value, uh, ju just apart from like their expertise, you know, if they're not like, if they're not skipping or, or if they're not like, you know, quitting their job and, and diving in full time or something like that, then you should be talking about really like single digit uh, equity allocation for them. And, and uh, not to get too far in the weeds, but probably what I'd recommend is, is, uh, is setting up uh, an equity incentive plan so that you can um, basically just reward them in um, in shares which have even more restrictions and uh, repurchase rights than you would even find under a restricted stock purchase agreement. So like everyone that, that comes in after you, you can say, yeah, well, I'll hire you on and you can have a stake in the company, but it's going to be subject to an equity incentive plan and just and just make sure you know that complies with all the securities laws. And um, and, and that's a great way to make sure that the company is is extra protected um, for, for taking someone on. Yeah, I'm going to uh, put up this slide again. So I, I think, you know, this is helpful in, in sort of thinking through that decision. Um, you know, what are they bringing to the table from, from you know, sort of these four categories? You know, I'm sure you can come up with others that, that would be, uh, you know, you can add to kind of the list to make that decision and then, you know, see if you can, put that into, you know, the, the number crunching machine and, and, and see what you come up with, uh, you know, and, and what is reasonable and, and then have that discussion. Wonderful. So uh, any last parting thoughts for the group? And then we're going to move on to the next session. You guys did a really amazing job on this. Lots of insights for everybody. So last thoughts. I uh, just thank you all for joining uh, in, in person and virtually as well. We hope you, uh, Hope you appreciated what we had to say and, and took something from it. Uh, you know, if you want to connect with us, our emails are up uh, on this slide here. The QR code, I believe, links to our intro page to, that goes to LinkedIn. Um, yeah, feel free to connect with us. Happy to discuss this or, or any other things related to uh, you know your your business or you know if you're not yet founding a company, uh, other other legal issues related uh, to, to startups. Thank you. Excellent. Bravo, fellas. Really good. Thank you.